This morning we're going to cover another two verses. So, uh, here's the thing. The, the structure of this entire letter flows from these next two verses. The observation that Jude makes about the challenges we face as believers in verse number 4, well, he'll defend those observations from verses 5 through 16. And then the appeal that he makes in verse number 3 to contend for the faith, well, we'll find out how to contend for the faith in verses 17 through 23. Which means the Bible doesn't leave us to our own imagination to determine for ourselves how we're to contend for for the faith. No, the Bible answers the how to on our behalf. And so we've already seen how Jude was uh, kind of set out to write an encouraging letter to the people. We saw that back in verse number two. In verse number two, his prayer was that God would multiply his mercy, his peace, and his love in their lives. I should have pointed out, so I'll point it out now, that the name Jude. Remember, it's a shortened form for either Judah or Judas. Uh, Well, that name literally means praise. Praise. And so Jude was anxious to praise God and to rejoice in the salvation that God gives to us through His Son. But what we're going to see in this letter is that the Spirit of God changed the mind of Jude. And it was the Spirit of God, not Jude's personal agenda, that led him to write about the battle against the ungodly. That's ultimately the theme of this letter. So why would the Spirit of God change the the mind of Jude? Well, because this instruction and this imperative was needed for the church then and is needed for the church today. I must confess that I'd rather sympathize with Jude. I'd much rather encourage and uplift believers than I would to declare war against the ungodly. But when the enemy enters into the building, then the watchman better not be asleep. Because Christianity is not a playground. It's a battleground to which we must engage in. And so souls are on the line, eternity is at stake. With that in mind, notice how he starts off verse number 3. He says, Beloved. Jude's going to tell them that he was eager to write to them about their common salvation. He says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. So Jude's original plan was to write a letter focusing on the common salvation that they shared with Jesus Christ or through Jesus Christ. But circumstances came about that demanded his immediate attention and it was a call to action. What were those circumstances? Well, false teachers had infiltrated the church. And as a a slave of Christ, Jude was not going to stand idly by and, and watch the church be led astray. And so Jude goes directly to the point. He makes an immediate appeal. He says, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing. And that verb appealing means to to urge to implore or to exhort. As believers, we're always to be prepared. We're always to be ready to articulate and to defend our faith. So Scripture tells us. We find that in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. It says, uh, but sanctify Christ as Lord of your hearts, Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So in the context of Jude 3, 
that verb appealing means to aggressively continue to defend the faith against false teachers. It is an aggressive, intentional defense of the faith. And so Jude's purpose goes beyond just offering friendly advice or a suggestion. No, this is a word from God. It's a word from God through Jude that would compel believers to take a specific course of action. And that specific course of action is identified. We're told, what's the action that we're supposed to take? Again, verse number 3. It says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about the common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. So the action is that we would contend earnestly for the faith. In fact, that entire Greek phrase uh, that you contend earnestly for comes from one Greek word. And that one Greek word is epigonismo. That's the Greek word. And what that word means, it means to, to make a strenuous or labored effort. It is from this word that we get our English word, agony. Okay? So, so in effect, Jude is ultimately, he's echoing uh, Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews 4, verse number 14, it says, Therefore, uh, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. And now he's telling us, in Jude, he's telling us, let us make a strenuous effort. Let us agonize together to contend for the faith. And so as children of God, we have been called, we have been commanded to contend earnestly for the faith. And that word faith here is referring uh, to the content of uh, what we believe. It's not talking about the saving faith. It's talking about the, the, the truth of God's Word, the truth of Scripture. It, it's talking about the knowledge of knowing the necessity of what is right and what is wrong. Now, I think it's surprising that Jude mentions this body of Christian truth, solid doctrine, but then he's going to address not the doctrine of false teachers, but rather the lifestyle of those false teachers. Which is interesting because obviously the Christian life is both truths about Christ and it's the imitation of the life of Christ. It's proper knowledge matched with proper actions. So it's not just what we know, it's what we know, also what we do with what we know. In 1 John chapter 2, verse number 6, it says that the one who says that he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. And so the false teachers of this New Testament period had often tried to separate orthodoxy from orthopraxy, which means they, they tried to separate truth from action. But you cannot separate belief from conduct. In fact, when what you do aligns with what you profess, then and only then will you know that your profession is true and genuine. So we can't separate the two. The two are ever so connected. So Christianity is not just what we affirm, but it also includes how we live out those affirmations. And so looking back at verse 3, he says, This faith was once for all handed down to the saints. <laughs> Which means that there are no further authoritative writings. There are, there are no further uh, visions or revelations from God. It means that the canon of God's Word is closed. It's complete. We have all the truth in His Word. We have all the truth that is needed 
and necessary to both know God and to live a life appropriately for the glory of God. And so that's why he said it's once for all handed down to the saints. And so then Jude proceeds to tell his readers why he's so concerned. He's so concerned because godless people had secretly slipped in among them. Look at verse 4. He says, For certain purses, persons have crept in unnoticed, those who are long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. For me, I can almost sense here taste the the disdain in Jude's voice when he refers to them as certain persons. And throughout the letter, he, he speaks in this way when he's mentioning his opposition. It becomes his intense mantra, if you will. He, he starts off referring to them as certain persons, but then he refers to them as these men. By the time you get to verses 8 and 10, certain person becomes these men. And then you read further by the time you get to verse number 16. And again in verse number 19, these men are relegated down to just these. And so he has this contempt. And so what we're going to see in these coming weeks together is that Jude's call to contend earnestly for the faith stems from his assessment of these certain persons. These certain persons of which he has absolutely nothing good, positive, or encouraging to say. In fact, he gives us several characteristics to describe these certain persons. First of all, I want you to notice that they're deceptive. He says that for certain persons have crept in unnoticed that crept in from greek simply means they have slipped in secretly and peter had warned christ has warned and peter had warned that that ungodly men were were coming false teachers were were coming and they were going to lead the church astray therefore be careful be on guard be aware peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 1, he says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the Master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. The church has always been warned about false teachers been warned that false teachers would arise and yet the church then even the church today in many places had failed to heed that warning rather than staying alert spiritual leaders had become careless and complacent and if we don't wake up and stay alert guarding and defending the truth of God's word then false teachers will creep in among us and deceive us. And that is not a healthy state for the church to be in. And so these certain persons, well, well, they were deceptive. They secretly slipped in among them. Notice he also categorizes them as simply ungodly persons. They were ungodly in their thinking. Uh, They were ungodly in their living in fact, when we look at verses 5 through 10, we'll have a better understanding of what it means to long before be marked out for this condemnation. And so rather than trying to unpack that today, well, we'll get to that later, uh, because for now, I want us to focus on those next two descriptive phrases. And I believe that these two phrases tell us what these certain ungodly people were doing. And it's the what of verse number 4 
that provides us the why for the entire letter. And so what were these people doing? Well, the answer is pretty straightforward. It's clear. They're challenging the faith. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turned the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. These ungodly people were challenging the faith in two specific ways. First of all, they were perverting God's grace. The verb turn, it means to, to transfer, to change, or to alter. It has the, the sense of, of changing something from one thing unto something completely different. It's altering its very nature. And so this was what the false teachers were attempting to do with the grace of God. They had perverted God's grace. They had distorted God's grace. They perverted and distorted the grace of God into an opportunity to indulge in licentiousness. Now don't let that word like trip you up. It's a long word. It's not a confusing word. Licentiousness simply means to indulge in sensual pleasure unrestrained by convention or morality. It is the unrestrained all-out pursuit of sensual pleasure. You should understand that false teachers promise freedom, but they only enslave people. Sin enslaves. Always. Sin always enslaves. So these false teachers are, are den denying Christ. They're denying the Word of God. And in their denial of Christ and of the Word of God, then they're attempting to remove the supreme authority over life. And once you try to remove supreme authority over our lives, and that's where all chaos breaks out. That's, where, that's why they feel the desire, the urgency to, to pursue selfishness, to pursue greed, to, to, to pursue their desires, their lusts, their wants of the things of this world, because they're trying to operate outside of the supreme authority of God and His Word, then that's why they're, they're seeking after much pleasure. They're seeking after much possession. But in the end, they're going to discover the common reality. And it's also significant. The reality is, the, the more you get, the more you want. It's a never-ending cycle. The more you get, the more you want. That's our nature. The more you, you get comfort, the more comfort you desire. The more you get money, the more money you desire. The more you, you, you get sex or sensual pleasure, the more you desire. The more you get recognition, the more you desire. When you operate outside of the supreme authority of God and His Word, then you're driven by those desires. Human nature is such that we want more, we want more, and we want more. Therefore, we must be restrained by a higher authority. And that higher authority is God and His Word. If we're not restrained then we'll become enslaved. We'll become enslaved to our desires and to our passions. I'll put it this way. Whatever overcomes a person is the very thing that enslaves that person. Scripture speaks to this back in Romans chapter 6, many, many months ago as we walked through this. Let us refresh your memory. Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse number 12, says, uh, yes, therefore... Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead 
and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, then you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? So Romans chapter 6 teaches us. And so what's happening here, in the simplest of terms, like Jude is writing his letter to the beloved, and he's saying like these deceptive, these, these ungodly false teachers who are among you, well, they're taking advantage and they're distorting the grace of God. But not only that, they're denying God's authority. He says for ungodly persons, who turned the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So, What is it that ultimately reveals or determines or makes known as to whether or not someone is a true teacher or a false teacher? How do you know? How do you tell? I'll give you one of the major issues or topics that we should focus in on when the teaching of other people is what they do with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will ultimately reveal whether a teacher is true or if they're false. In 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. There's the test, right? And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is coming, and now it is already in the world. You are from God little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth in the spirit of error. Ultimately, what a person believes about Jesus reveals whether or not they're true or false. What a person confesses about Jesus exposes their spirit. Either they have the spirit of truth or they have the spirit of error. And so through this all-out pursuit of sensual living, the twisting and the distorting of the grace of God, these false teachers were actively denying the identity and the authority of Jesus Christ. Look at the two titles that he uses in Jude 4. It's our Master and Lord. Those two titles used together stress Jesus' complete authority Jesus deserves nothing less than full submission and complete obedience in and from our lives. Nothing less. No matter how helpful other teachers might be, if they deny, if they deny the deity of Christ, if they ignore the sovereignty of God, if they refuse the sufficiency of Christ, if they reject the substitutionary atonement of our Lord and Savior, then there's a massive problem because they are without hope. They are an enemy of God. They are from the world. They have the spirit of the Antichrist and we must not be among them. 
separate ourselves from that. We must align and submit ourselves to God and His Word. We must surround ourselves with pastors and teachers that will uphold and uplift and expand and expound upon God's holy word. Helping us to understand God's instruction and His purpose. We don't sacrifice the teaching of His word. We don't struggle and ask questions like, how do we become more relevant in our community to attract more people to our congregation? No, we, we preach and we teach the Word of God. We stand firm on His Word. We don't back down from that. And we protect God's house. We make sure that the teaching that we receive is genuine and authentic and aligns with God's Word. We're, we're, we're watchmen protecting the sheep and will not allow the false teaching to creep into the church and lead us astray and damage or discredit our testimony in the community in which we live. And God's people, we need to be constantly reminded to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Which means that God has given us His Word to instruct us. He has given us His Son to redeem us. He, he has given us His Spirit to enable and to empower us to live in obedience and to live for the glory of God. He has given us His church, the fellowship of His children, to encourage and motivate us to to live righteously in a wicked and perverse world. We do not need a fresh revelation from God. What we need is a fresh understanding and a proper application of the gospel in our lives. That's what we need. The gospel that's been revealed through Jesus Christ and the gospel that has been written and recorded and handed down to us through His Holy Word. We don't need to get a new word from God. We need to get into the Word of God and properly apply it to our hearts and to our lives. May you be encouraged to do that. May you love His Word. May you be disciplined to read and to study His Word. May you memorize it so that you can recall it. May you understand that it is the the Word of God that is our weapon to stand against the schemes of Satan. Therefore, pick up your weapon. Engage in the battle. Battleground, not a playground. Heavenly Father, help us to have a great love for your word. Help us to fully submit and surrender ourselves unto you and your word. And may we live our lives under the awareness of the supreme authority that exists through your word and through you. Help us, Father, to walk in obedience. Help us to desire righteous living. God, in this moment, uh, an opportunity to respond to your word. I pray that your conviction would lead us to the proper responses in this moment. May those who don't know you respond in submission to your son and receive the salvation that's offered in and through him. For those that do know you, belong to you and are your children, may they confess and repent from sin. May they walk We all walk in obedience unto you. God, help us with decisions, whether it's decisions for baptism, decisions for church membership, decisions for ministry, engagement, whatever it is, Father. God, I pray your spirit would move among us in this time, and I pray that we, your people, would make decisions that would honor and glorify you. We give this time unto you. Be pleased, Father. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's sing through this song.